think first we're going to drink some wine. Just us, unfortunately. So, yeah, here comes the wine. I mean, I guess while the wine is being served, so we're not just sitting here with deep expectation. Sorry. I know our wine provider wants to give a few words, but with these kinds of discussions, especially at this time of day, I think you're a little tired, you've been sitting in your seat, so I want to keep it very punchy. I want us to interrupt each other. Okay. I want the debate to be lively, but if we're having wine, I don't want it to be too lively. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe just to start, I don't know if you want to say your... your well, I would just uh, say a few words about Perfect. the wine that uh, you're going to taste. It is from Abadia Retuerta. Abadia Retuerta is a winery in the north of Spain. It's uh, more than 900 years old. And the reason why the monks established there is probably the reason why we want to be faithful to that legacy. We are talking about a project that is, it has five kilometers of uh, Duero River. We are talking about the place where the Duero Valley narrows itself so much that it creates a very specific microclimate. And the wine that this gentleman, the lady that are tasting tonight, is a Selección Especial, probably the soul of our property, because it is a selection of the best plots, of the 54 different plots that we have in the property. And I hope, well, you try it. Well, not today. They, they are going to try it. But I, hope we can, I hope we can drink it as well, not yes, just taste yeah, it. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> You will enjoy, Philippe. Gracias. <laughs> Philippe, do you want to give a little review of the wine? Or? No, no, no. Just, <laughs> I'm sure it's, well, it's going to be beautiful. It's a famous, uh, famous brand. Thank you. Gracias. You're welcome. Excellent. Okay, enjoy. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, now that we're loosened up a little instantly, I wanted to start just with a quick rapid fire round, starting with you, Nuria. Tell us a little bit about the last two years. I know the last two years have been a little bit of a wild ride for everyone in this room, but how is, well, how have the last two years strengthened your business? How are you better than you were two years ago now? Yeah, as you mentioned, like the last two years has been challenging in, in the industry, but on in, an industry level, uh, we have to say we have a very successful uh, summer. I mean, it's been, uh, you know, a huge achievement to, to recover the, the, the global travel um, in, the, in the different markets, in, in regional markets. Um, this is from industry perspective, and I will say in particular from Trip.com. We are very happy we saw the fruits of our investment in the up first strategy where we were named um, the number 10 OTA. OTA, for the ones that are not familiar with the jargon, is online travel agency. So on the first um, half of 2022, uh, we made it to the top 10. And I think this is a proof that there is growth. Yeah, so your business is better than it was two years ago. It is. Philippe, yeah. what about you? How's your, your business has changed in the last two years. Uh, drastically. <laughs> so I was CEO of Forbes Travel Guide during COVID, and that was brutal. I'm not going to lie about it. We had 65 full-time inspectors that couldn't inspect because the hotels were closed. We had 25 full-time trainers that couldn't train because the hotels were closed. So we put a lot of people on furlough. We also laid off some people. There is no secret about that. And then we revamped our whole training program online. So people were able to get it by webinar, live training, or uh, virtual training. So that worked very well. And obviously, we got through COVID uh, successfully. Uh, today, the business is absolutely booming. We know there's a shortage of staff in all around the world, basically, in hotels. So people need training, 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 training. And they're obviously we'll, desperate. We'll, we'll get to those challenges. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. But <laughs> basically, as a consultant, which I am now, it's a fantastic time. Everybody Business needs, is booming, no? Yeah. Everybody needs help. Everybody needs support. Everybody needs advice. So I started my consultancy business exactly at the right time. OK. Yeah. Great. That's great for you. Enrique, uh, you have a beautiful property, a beautiful winery. I'm sure a lot of people are wanting to go there and escape. Yeah. How has business 
been strengthened in last, by the last two years at well, the winery? Yeah, uh, last uh, two years has been uh, challenging, as you said, but uh, both are going to be record in, in sales, in positioning, in recognition, and mainly with, uh, with the team. The big challenge uh, during uh, COVID uh, was obviously how to retain talent. So we made a, a big, big uh, effort with a lot of training, so it was good for consultants like uh, Philip and others. The second thing was uh, to be very, very, very positive. So to maintain activity through a screen is not an easy one, but uh, we maintain not only with our team, we maintain also with uh, OTAs, travel agents, journalists, friends of uh, the brand. In fact, I defined a plan that was called Abadía de Tuerta, a friend. So don't be for, if people owe you money, don't push uh, that uh, now. That is not uh, today's objective. To, the objective is to go through this pandemic that nobody knew uh, in a way that was uh, easy for everybody and we could maintain relationships in a very professional way. So, so talent, uh, digital, being positive and then creating new experiences. So you have, uh, imagine a hotel, a winery that mainly sells in restaurants and uh, a spa. Uh, uh, then you have other things, the three restaurants and no customers. So let's train a lot, let's train, mm -hmm. let's create new experiences. And that uh, is working and that's why 2022 is going to be the record year of Abadía de Torta. Okay, wow. Okay, well, the good thing is you already answered my next question. So I'm <laughs> gonna go down to Philip. <laughs> what about the, the biggest challenge you had over the last two years? You touched on it a little, but how did you overcome that challenge? You know, there's probably been more than one challenge, but what's been the biggest one and what was the solution? If you can share it with us. Uh, the biggest one is when you're in the middle of a crisis is the realization that hope is not a strategy, right? That's a very important one because a lot of businesses said, we'll wait a little bit and see what happens because COVID will disappear in two or three months. And I think at Forbes Travel Guide, we realized quite early on that this was serious and that the year was gone and that probably the, the first two quarters of the next year would be gone as well, right? And we acted accordingly. What is important in that process is communication. Um, at the end, Forbes is a company where staff, the average stay with Forbes is about 10 years. So it's a very loyal member of staff. So every time you have to put somebody on furlough or fire somebody, it's incredibly painful, right? And it's felt throughout the team. So communication and explanation to them every time you do it, why does this happen? And we need to safeguard the future of the company and therefore sacrifices are necessary. And then after a while, staff starts to understand. It's never pleasant, right? And they will still, uh, they will still make negative comments about it, but at least you keep them together, you keep that team spirit. And now, of course, we're at a different time frame. Now we start building again and everybody's hugely optimistic about the future. Nuria, you had a similar experience at Trip.com with, uh, with staff, right? What, was, what were you doing at, at Trip.com to make sure that you didn't lose all the, all the people that you had under your, yeah, under your exactly. wing? Yeah, exactly. I mean, pandemic, obviously, you know, it was the big challenge that we mentioned, and I mean, the industry is still working through. However, something that it was very important to, is to keep the confidence. The company was keeping the confidence in the, in the travel industry, and... We, we maintain the, the staff that we have, and we were even hiring people in the, in the new markets that we were expecting to, to open in, in the European regions. So I think this, this support from part of the company and being positive and expecting that, you know, things will get better, it was, it was very, very important. And we established local teams because it's uh, at this time as well, having these local insights of of people that they are on ground is, is, very, is very important for us, yeah. Well, also for the, the boom of the last summer that you mentioned, you were in a very good position to hit the ground running and, and be prepared for the, the big explosion of work, no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we mentioned before about what it happened, even the chaos during, during last summer in the travel industry. I mean, uh, it's, it's something that we were ready there. I mean, it's something that I think we should all learn and prevent for, for that coming time. We need to, to really have the, the staff and, and, and all the, the procedures in place to, to be ready. 
for this recovery. Well, that's what I want to talk about, actually, the whole, I guess, the theme of this is instability and how we're dealing with it. I mean, from personal experience, the, over the last summer, I didn't travel. I mean, I'm living in Ibiza now, so, like, the world comes to me, so I can see all the people I know, but I deliberately didn't travel because I saw the chaos at the airports, and I just thought, okay, I'm just going to have a break. I started traveling again now. That's why I'm here, I guess. But I guess, how do you think the world, start with you, Enrique, how has the world actually changed since 2019? Is it, are we living in a completely different travel world? Is it like a whole new environment that we have to start from the beginning? Or I think uh, personally it's, uh, it's completely different, but it's something that was coming. Okay? I think uh, we are no longer tourists and we are travelers. And the main difference uh, with that is that uh, when you're a traveler, you want to understand the place you are visiting, you want to understand uh, the food, the wine, the people, the craftsmanship of that region, the museums, other things. So that uh, we, we saw was happening already with, uh, let's say, luxury traveling, and uh, uh, COVID accelerated that. So that, that is, uh, for me, the main change. Obviously, we need to, to, to be more digital, but everybody was already on that, and thanks to our transformation plan, we were uh, uh, ready during COVID. And the other thing that uh, I think is changing and will take more time is uh, sustainability. So it's something that uh, people, they are not deciding yet the destination or the hotel by sustainability, but they ask more, they love to stay in an organic garden talking with the person in charge of the, of the garden. They love to, to, to see that there is no plastic. They love to see that, that you have more local food than um, the meat is coming, I don't know, from Germany, for example. So uh, all this is adding value to our proposition. And, uh, and also uh, people really like say, to, to, well, what I said at the very beginning, to understand the place where they are, not the culture of the, of the place. Nuria, is that something you're seeing at trip.com, that people want sustainability as one of the reasons they're considering when they book a trip? Yeah, definitely. I mean, sustainability is, is important pillar, and, and actually we've been uh, working, 3.com group has been working in collaboration with WTTC in a report that we have released uh, like just basically 10 days ago, and we have seen it's a key factor. I mean, we got nearly 80% of, of travelers, they, they feel that sustainability is very important. And from our side, we have also partner with companies, uh, like we are founding a partner of Travelease, where it's uh, a UK company that is in, in collaboration with other brands, uh, global brands from, from travel, to make sure we can cater this sustainability that users, uh, users they are expecting and, and they are eager to, to have. And also on the technologi technological part, we have also partnered with Choose, where it's a climate, climate uh, tech company where we are uh, explaining the, the customers, I mean, where are the CO2 emissions and how you can offset that and contribute, you know, towards to have another project that can help, uh, you know, the climate and, and, and invest in sustainability. And sustainability, I think, is not only, is not only important from a guest perspective, it's also, respons uh, it's also important from an employee perspective, yeah. because the young generation, when you interview the young generation, I mean, first of all, they're interviewing sometimes, you, sometimes yeah. they're interviewing <laughs> exactly. you, right? Because <laughs> there are so many questions, but they ask a lot about what is the company policy about sustainability? Yeah. What are you doing to make the world a better place? Because the new generation, and I'm sorry if there's a lot of young people in the room, but they have a huge sense of entitlement, right? They want to earn money straight away. They want to be promoted straight away but they want a purpose, and they choose the company because of its purpose, a purpose that they can believe in, and sustainability is a very important part of that. Right? You don't think the older generation is like that as well? Well, the older, if I look at the guests and I talk to the general manager, it's especially the younger generation that is really interested and starts asking questions about sustainability and social responsibility. Yeah. What are you doing for the community? And what you said is absolutely true. I always say to general managers, hotels should be the facilitators for the guests to experience the best the destination has to offer in terms of local food, Crap local culture, food. history, etc. And it starts with the staff. For me, sense of place starts with the staff. That 
We tell the staff to be themselves. We allow them to be themselves. I want to feel, I want to be served by Spanish people. They have flair, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. And not script the language and not tell them what to say and how to greet you. It's of course, work, they need yeah. training, but let them be themselves. I think that's the key to service excellence. I was at a luxury hotel uh, in Ibiza and uh, they were having a problem, obviously, with the staff because the, 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 there's a shortage of accommodation, so there's a shortage of staff. A lot of things were going wrong. Every time something went wrong, the staff had a script, which was, don't worry, you're in Ibiza, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. relax, take <clears throat> a deep breath. And it became so annoying because they just, I just want my glass of water. I want to take a deep breath. <laughs> but getting back to, I guess we're going to oscillate between the negative and positive forecasts, but are there... Philippe, are there storm clouds on the horizon? I mean, are there many storm clouds? Obviously, we talked about climate change, but there's more things, no? I'm going to be very honest. I, I don't think there are storm clouds on the horizon, but we still have a bumpy ride ahead, right? Something has to give here. Everybody's looking for staff, so automatically, staff has to work harder, so there's a higher burnout rate. Service levels automatically drop, I'm not saying by much, but they do drop. Rates, however, have increased anywhere from 25 to 100 percent. If you go to the resort hotels in Italy, Spain, Spain, uh, Greece, 100 percent increase in rate. So if I'm a guest and in 2019 I paid 800 dollars for my room, I'm now paying 2,000 for my room with less service, where is the value proposition here, right? And some GMs, and I can understand them, because they've had two years of closing, of misery, no revenues. Now they want to maximize. But I also want them to think about this client. Is he going to be a return client? Is he ever going to return to your hotel? Or would he feel that 2019 I paid 800, now I paid 2000, was it worth it? And am I going to return to that hotel? Yeah. I think Budget for next year is very much a thing of the finger in the air. I think we'll end up somewhere between the rate of 2019 and now, but in 2023. How easy is it, though, to kind of create a strategy, a long-term strategy, when things keep changing so rapidly? I mean, I call this age a little bit the age of earthquakes. We're still, like, it's still being shaken up. We've still got aftershocks. How can you build a house when the, the ground is still shaking? You know? It's so, very difficult because so what, there's what do still you do, a, though? a very high level of uncertainty. Right? And I think corporate offices should also rely on their general manager and their leadership in the destination. Because if I'm sitting in corporate and somebody in China tells me, this is how it's going to be, trust him. If you've hired the right guy, trust him. Support him rather than control him. Yeah. Okay. Nuria, what about, um, I guess, with trip.com? Things we were talking before about things just like the change in the value of the dollar, uh, flight prices going up, is that uh, affecting, that can affect the business, but also the, the, the strategy that you have. So what kind of things do you have in place to adapt to those sudden changes that could affect your whole year-long forecast? Yeah, I mean, as a company, you always have your long-term strategy, but at Treat.com as well, we, we always have, uh, this is short-term, I mean, we have roadmaps that they go on a quarterly basis, so we are very agile as well to, to adjust. And I mean, working very closely with, with the technology and, and with the big data that we have access. So we kind of adjust very quickly. We can predict and try, and is what you were mentioning as well, having these local insights. And I think it's very important to keep the, the communication, especially you know, in the different teams that they are set up at local level, at regional level, and at head office level. And I think when you put together these three components, I mean, things can be done faster. And, and you can be agile and adjust to, to these changes that they are beyond our control. Well, before I move on to the next section, I don't think you guys answered my question fully because I wanted a bit more, you know, a bit more forecast of potential doom and gloom. What is keeping you awake at night in all of your businesses? What, what makes you lose sleep with things that you're worried about that could affect everything? Enrique. <laughs> well, uh, to have another, let's say, you're closing down the wall, no? That's, uh, and thinking about uh, 170 families that we have between the winery and, and the hotel. But uh, we, we normally say in Spain that uh, you need to look uh, el vaso medio lleno, no? the glass half, half full. full, not yeah, half empty. Absolutely. No? absolutely. So I tend to be positive. You're also drinking the glass, I imagine. Yeah, sometimes, with moderation, okay? <laughs> no, and the other thing is, uh, 
you need to live uh, day by day and to be ready for, for the future always. So I'm not scared. Uh, the only thing is that uh, the only thing we have not changed when you have values is the philosophy of working. And uh, there are two words that uh, uh, Philip described very well is uh, customer centric and price is, you need to think about that. In my first job in, in the UK, in the Agio, I learned uh, one thing that was always over deliver, never <coughs> over promise. No? Yeah. So that oh, is uh, my think. philosophy. So I don't want the last uh, dollar from my guest, I want them to enter as a guest and then to live as an apostle, no? Mm -hmm. So the team is trained with quality, with service, with eye catching, with just to, to, to behave. And the other thing is uh, data. Thanks to, to the digital transformation of our company, now I have more information that I need, but uh, it's good to cross, to see, well, now this market is closed, now this market is open, now we need to invest here and the team is reacting uh, fast, agile, Great. and uh, working with, uh, with a team spirit. No? And what, you're, what you're saying to me is you sleep very well. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I sleep <laughs> very, very well because I have, my consciousness is very calm Clear. now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Philippe, are you? Well, for me, it's without a doubt a labor crisis, yeah. right? Um, I think we need to repair our reputation in hospitality. And it is very true that for the last 20, 30 years, we've gotten away with murder. We've paid people minimum salaries. We've asked them to work long hours. Those days are over. And first of all, owners and operators need to understand that their P&L statements are going to change, right? Yeah. For example, if I take London today, let's say the average luxury hotel, 150 rooms, they're looking for between 90 and 100 positions, right? Why do they survive? Because August, for example, STR report of the top luxury section in London, in 2019, they did 78%. In August this year, 42%, right? So if everybody says the business is back to normal, it is not back to normal. And this is why they can survive with less staff. The moment they go back to normal occupancies, they're going to suffer, that's clear. What do we need to do to solve this crisis? I'm a strong believer in apprenticeships, bring young people out of any schools, not only hotel schools. First, we have to work with vocational hotel schools rather than the universities, because Glion, Les Roches, Cornell, Lausanne, they are no longer hospitality schools, they're business schools. No. And those people go into finance and into technology, oh, yeah. etc. I was on a webinar with the dean of Cornell and she said to me something very powerful. She said, Every year, the top 30, 40 students of hospitality are taken by Morgan Stanley, financial. Why? Not only because they get double or triple the money there, but because the financial business values hospitality skills. And she pointed at me and she says, you take them for granted. Wow. Do you take them for granted? No, absolutely not. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. <laughs> Nuria, are you having nightmares at night about potential challenges on the horizon? Are you also sleeping very well? Yeah, no, no not really nightmares. But I mean, you mentioned, um, Philip, as well about the, the pricing, obviously, like, you know, having, uh, you know, airfares and, and, and hotels as well increasing. Uh, we, we cater different individuals. So, I mean, we want to to get competitive prices and, and the right products to offer to, to our clients. So I think this, this is important. And another aspect it will be as well, like being ready again to have the, the long haul travel, travel back and learn from, from what we mentioned, I mean, during this summer, how we can do things, things better. So yeah, I think these two, two aspects. On I mean, in this age of earthquakes as well, everything is being redefined. One thing that's being redefined is the word luxury, but the word luxury is always being redefined or hijacked sometimes by different people. Working for Monocle, I've got a very broad view of what uh, luxury is. It's definitely for me not this, this Dubai model of bling bling and you know ostentatious luxury. What is luxury in 2022 for you, Enrique? Well, we have uh, pretty clear that luxury has uh, changed. And uh, as I said, customer centric, uh, is, is we need to really understand and to hear what is happening in, in the market now. Uh, uh, luxury for me is time, okay? So we define ourselves as uh, managers of uh, happiness. We are not a hotel, we are not a winery, we are not uh, uh, a spa, 
we uh, people, when they come to Abadiera Tuerta, they give us uh, the best asset they have, is their time with their family, with their friends. With that philosophy, anybody at Abadiera Tuerta is entitled to destroy that moment, okay? So that's why I like standards and high quality. Yep. That doesn't mean you need to be stiff. You, you mentioned very well. I think you need to train uh, yourself and your team in order to, to service the, uh, people not in the old style that, that you are like a servant. Is that, that they understand what they are doing, what they are drinking, what they are eating, what they can do in the location. If they want to fly balloon, yes. If they want to ride horses, yes. And then the other thing is adding layers of value. And that was for me, uh, so we have a hotel, restaurant, winery, wellness, experiences, but you need something else that feels you special. And that is for me the layers of value of uh, sustainability and art, because art gives you some view to the back of your history, of your country or whatever, the present and also the future. So one of the things that I am learning uh, during these uh, two years is that to make uh, good things to the local community is really important, to generate new jobs, to generate, for example, we have our own honey, and it's not done by my team, it's with young people that they want to make uh, then uh, wine salt or then uh, pine nuts, silly things, mm -hmm. but they are really important for... But this for is luxury, you know? It's luxury. Th things yeah. done people, well, they want absolutely. to really understand, oh, this honey was done, and I am having the breakfast with your local honey, yeah, these young people, they made this, and they want to see the young people. Yeah. So uh, it's what I said at the very beginning, we are no longer tourists, that uh, you make a selfie and you don't know where mm -hmm. you are. You don't look to the Mona Lisa, or you don't need yeah. the, Now you want to really live the culture of the place. Philippe, what about... Luxury? luxury for me is extraordinary service. It's very simple. So at Forbes, you know, we inspect and we train the best hotels in the world. Um, we have 900 standards, and why is it so difficult? Why do we inspect 1,800 hotels around the world and only have 324 five stars? Because 75% of our standards are about how do you make the customer feel in your hotel. Wait a minute, you said you said 900 standards? 900, 900 standards 900 for the hotel, criteria. restaurants and spas, wow. 900. 75 are about quality of service. I visited, in the last four years, I visited 350 luxury hotels around the world, which was a great experience because they feel that if they look after the CEO, they're going to get a better rating, right? Yeah. Which is absolutely not true, but I want them <laughs> to think that, right? <laughs> so sure, I'm not as scared to so I stayed, my, my I stayed in a lot of presidential <laughs> suites around the world, right? Brilliant. But anyway, they always ask me, what is the best hotel for you? And my funny answer was, today it's you, right? Tomorrow it might be somebody else. <laughs> but the real, but my real feeling is when I go to a hotel and I get the first coffee or I get the first thing to eat and the first contact with the service member, if I feel that he enjoys the service experience as much as I do, now we're in a luxury hotel. It's very simple. That's a high and you part. know that after 10 minutes in a hotel, yeah. when they enjoy the service experience as much as you do, you're in a luxury hotel. Why? Because you know that they are being valued by their bosses, they're being respected, they're being treated with dignity because they're happy, they feel good in their own skin, they have self-esteem, right? And that is the most important thing that we need to do and realize with the younger generation. Yeah. Make them feel valued, give them a purpose, give them a dream that you want to achieve together, right? And do the right things in terms of social responsibility, like you very well said. And those, that for me is happiness. I mean, being in a hotel and feeling truly cared for, that is luxury for me. Yeah. Nuria? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with uh, what Philippe and, and Enrique they are saying. Um, and I will also say, like, this service, this personalization as well, I think is, is so important nowadays, uh, like, to feel, you know, like, kind of this unique treatment and, and to cater the needs that you have, but even to anticipate to the needs that you may have at, at the hotel. I mean, it's been some experiences, and even last night during the cocktail re uh, reception that we have at, at Thompson, uh, I can explain, like, a very, you know, a, a sample, very exact sample, where our colleague was asking for a gluten-free beer. And I mean, obviously, they, they brought it to him. 
and then thank you. I mean, very, very pleased. And just two, three minutes after they met, the, the person in, in charge of the catering came with a selection of tapas that they were all wow. gluten free. And this is a proactive way. And, and I think this is something very, mm -hmm. very important as well. And, and we all want to, to feel um, exclusive somehow, but without being over, uh, you know, treating you. I mean, because we are, as you were saying, we are all human beings and we want to, to be happy and make the other people yep. happy. But I think this, this service is, is key. Um, another aspect that we mentioned, I think is very important about the wellness that can be even beyond and spa. It can be like where you go and, and you can practice, uh, I don't know, your yoga class or, or, we, or we are expecting very healthy food as well that Absolutely. at home if I have oat milk and I buy myself and expecting as well to, to have this if, if, I go, if I go a hotel. And the last one we touch uh, about it is about the sustainability as well, yeah. Yeah, also what you were just saying before, it's like rather than treat people like customers, treat them like people, no? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, at least, yeah. So it's just like another, another. And it's uh, very important what Philip said, uh, we call the magic of, uh, of the place, no? When the experience of the, the employee experience connects with the experience of the guest. And that is something you cannot improvise. No. So in our hotel, for example, everybody has tasted the breakfast, they have had a massage, they, have, they know what they are selling. Yeah. And then I receive a lot of uh, emails, WhatsApps, Amazing. messages yeah. saying, they, they don't say, how good was your service? Yeah. Uh, Fernanda was unbelievable in that. Uh, how nice is Angel in the reception? How, mm -hmm. they, they mention the it's name. Amazing. And that, uh, you know, it, it's like... No, a, no, it gives yeah, you goosebumps, yeah, it, right? Yeah, no. it's, it's something really, uh, and then, with that, you have a, a very high level of repetitors. That's something I want to talk about as well in the, the kind of final section is this idea of exclusivity as well. Like we talk about luxury, we talk about exclusivity. There's a lot of talk about the ultra high net worth individual market, the jet set coming. Do you think a city like Madrid, for example, or even Spain is prepared to offer the services for these very demanding individuals? And what are they demanding? I'm sure you're dealing with some of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, Madrid is, is doing great, I think. This is uh, uh, a real, uh, the real Spain, no? Madrid, uh, where you have uh, hospitality, you have new, new hotels now, you have gastronomy, you have everything is much better than 10 years ago and you can see the flow of people coming, no? But are the services there? Like, I guess, with the new, ho the new luxury hotels that are opening, the, the Edition, the Thompson, the New Ritz, yeah, uh, I think, uh, maybe they're the, filling the void, no? Yeah, made the, the homework, as Philip said. I, when Philip was talking about training and, and, and studying and, and, and standards, I think that uh, what we need to do, and Madrid has done, is to dignify the profession, you know? Uh, I experienced in, in my life, I'm from Seville, uh, in the past, uh, you had people cooking. Now you have chefs. In the past, uh, you had uh, people taking care of mm -hmm. a garden. Now you have landscaper. In Architect. the past, so, <laughs> <laughs> so artists. And why? Because they believe in what they do. I think we need to do the same with the reception. I, need, I think we need to do the same with uh, waiters, with uh, people of housekeeping. And Madrid, I think, has done like this. Mm -hmm. You can always improve because when you are ambitious, you have uh, the ambition, you never relax, no? When you have the first Michelin star, you want the second to maintain the first the first, okay? So you need to have that. So I think that the, uh, Madrid is doing uh, really well, but uh, we need more uh, more training. No? Philip, do you think so? Uh, I, I think it's, a, it's the confidence as well, right? Because yeah. I, was, I used to come a lot to Madrid because when I was with Orient Express, we used to own 50% of the Ritz Hotel, right? So I used to come here all the time. And I felt that, and somebody said that today, that Madrid was, there was a glass ceiling that Madrid couldn't get through yeah. compared to Barcelona. Barcelona in those days, I'm talking 10 years ago, was already doing 600 euros average rate in their top yeah. hotels. And in Madrid, it was 300. What was the reason? Because Madrid is a fantastic city with the culture, the food, you have it all. Yeah? Now that glass ceiling has been broken. And I can feel it now coming back that there is a bigger level of confidence. And everybody knows that now 
And it's not only because of the Four Seasons and Rosewood and, and Mandarin Oriental coming in. It's a total level, uh, the level of conf confidence has changed, right? People have now the guts and the confidence to say, we are a city, we can compete with Barcelona, and they're doing it. So I think the potential for Madrid is unlimited. Yeah. Do you think destinations should only be thinking about how to attract these very wealthy jet set travelers, though? Do you think, um, is, that, is that a problem? He, or a Their expectations haven't changed, but like he said, you have to train your staff. The expectations of the guests are individual, right? So you have to treat them like individuals. Some people will still be a little uncertain. Some people will, they don't want any safety regulations regarding COVID, etc. But the staff has to be more anticipatory and they have to feel what the client wants, right? And what? they have to treat them differently. But I don't agree when people say we live in a different world, everything has changed. No, you still want to go to a hotel, you want to be cared for, you want to be treated like a human being, and you want emotional experiences. But expectations are higher, maybe. Expectations now. are higher, but you want emotional experiences. And emotional experiences, somebody earlier on the panel was talking about loyalty. For me, loyalty, I have a very strong opinion about that. And a lot of people might not disagree, might disagree. Loyalty cannot be bought for me. You cannot buy loyalty with money, points, or miles. You buy loyalty with emotional experiences. And emotional experiences you don't make with your bed and your shower. You like your bed and you like your shower, but emotional people, emotional experiences are with people. And emotional connections are with people. And once you've made those, those are emotional experiences, and you will go back and back to that same hotel as again. Because they know you, they know your name, they know what you want, and they treat you kindly, and they take care of you. That's perfect. And that's what services are That's perfect, are about. because my last question, we're going to wrap it up now, is about your personal preferences. So what, Nuria, could you tell us, what is a place that has your loyalty, or a place that you're excited about going to? And tell us why, maybe. Yeah, in terms of, of destinations and places, and just before I wanted to touch base on what Philip was saying as well, I think, you know, we always talk, talk about return of investment, but I think return of emotions is very important and is when you, we can have, because as a brand, I think you need to get in love with the brand before, yeah. and then you will repeat as a, as a customer. So, yeah, I think that's a very, very important point and very um, interesting. And back to the destination, I mean, I'm passionate about traveling. I live now in Madrid, so I mean, we've been talking a lot about Madrid. So I have the, the chance to experience the, this city every day, and I've been in many hotels around and, and trying. But if I have to, to choose a destination, it's quite difficult. But I was thinking, like, which is the first destination I went to after the long, I mean, after the lockdown and when long haul travel was open, and it was Mexico. And I think it's a good compromise in the sense of airline connections. I mean, they, they are really good from, from Madrid. You also have a very uh, hotel offer there. And then combine, I think, three things that I really like. It's about gastronomy, it's about culture, and it's about, you know, having the opportunity to go to the beach and even to go diving. That is something that I have passion about. Well, I want to stay in Madrid over the last two <laughs> days. So first of all, last, last night, the cocktail at Thompson was excellent. I mean, very good food. There was one, cocktail, there was one um, canapé that was a bit difficult, which was the long leaves of salad, right? And I'm Belgian, I'm a little bit slow, so that didn't <laughs> go very well. But the rest of the food was excellent. And then we're staying at the Audition, and I think the Audition is an excellent hotel, because Audition has the balance between design, comfort, and people, absolutely right, right? They treated us like kings, staff is down to earth, natural, yeah. there is no scripted totally. language, and I just love it. And when I looked at the VIP amenities, I go to so many hotels where there is a bottle of champagne and a bottle of red wine and fruit and, cham and, and cheese and, and charcuterie, I'm alone, right? How did that gentleman manager know that I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you finish your wine, also. But you know what they served us at the edition as a welcome gift was castanetas Castaneta. oh, in wow. chocolate. Very typical. Beautifully made with a little card explaining the history of the castanetas and a very nice handwritten card by the general manager. That's all I need. No. And that yeah. made me really happy and comfortable. Yeah. 
So you're booking another trip tonight, coming back to Madrid, or you're staying, you're staying permanently now? Well, I wish, <laughs> I wish, but tomorrow morning I have to go back, unfortunately. You have 350 hotels to visit, right? <laughs> yeah, but listen, it's been a great experience, right? And that is what I want the younger generation to understand. Our business is such an adventure, right? I started as a commie chef in the kitchen. I never went to university. I made it to CEO, right? This is still possible in our business. Which other business can you do that? You want to go and work for a technology company, sit behind a computer, or a bank, sit behind a computer? I mean, I've worked in nine countries. I've met thousands of interesting yeah. people. Uh, I've got to learn about cultures, about, about their history, about their arts, etc. I mean, what a life, right? One adventure after the other. And somebody tells me that it's 20 years old, that they want to sit behind the computer. I think, you're mad. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> you're mad. Go and work in hospitality. It's great. It's glamorous. If you make it to a certain level, you will make money. And you will have a wonderful life. And you can see the world, and your tickets are paid by somebody else. I mean, what's better? And you meet a lot of nice people. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. A lot of fun. Actually, as a journalist, I met a lot of, I worked at a, a nightclub here as well. It's many, well, not some years ago, not that too many years ago. And I met a lot of people looking after the, the VIP in that, in that club. It's just like the place where it's great. great connections, especially in Madrid. Yeah. Enrique. Well, I Where are you going? I, <laughs> well, I love uh, Spain and uh, brand Spain, and Spain needs uh, to continue uh, working to, to be a, a reference in, in this luxury, how we have described. Uh, emotionally talking, as, as Philip was saying very well, uh, my last trip, uh, well, not my last, my trip uh, with uh, last year was to Mexico, my silver wedding anniversary with, with my wife, obviously, and uh, to a hotel of a leading hotels that was, uh, it reminds me a lot of Adiere Tuerta Noise, close to Merida, but you have a Spanish hacienda, you have the local food, they had also the local honey, mm -hmm. the, 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 the service, the, the employees always smiling, the spa was wonderful. So we didn't, we didn't need, need even a car. We didn't want to leave the location. <laughs> you had everything there. And I think that is uh, what is uh, going to be happening in, in this uh, country also. Now you see more uh, people restoring a palace, people restoring an abbey, a castle, a special location that is not an urban only. Mm -hmm. no? I, I think we need Madrid to people to, to come through Madrid and then two hours driving mm -hmm. to a place like ours or, or this one in Mexico. So I think that that is uh, what I really like. I don't want to go, as Philip was saying also, to a hotel just to sleep and to have a lot of things that I cannot use. Yeah. So, you know, because uh, well, emotional, viaje, con emotional connection. Yeah. Buen viaje. Uh, I guess tonight we're going to be celebrating at the, the group dinner and all of us will probably be judging and analyzing maybe the service and seeing if the waiters <laughs> are happy and smiling. But I'd like to thank you for your contributions and see you tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.